Welcome to today's online service replay. My name is Stella and here is the latest recorded sermon from our Malaga Hub. So get ready with something to take some notes down and we pray and anticipate that God will speak to you through his word and through today's speaker. All right, so we are in Acts chapter 20 today and uh, I was getting... Uh, doing somersaults in my heart this week as I was reading through this I I was gonna really want to preach on one thing and then I went to another thing and then the Lord really quickened the third thing which is where I'm going to land today I really like the idea of someone falling asleep during a sermon and falling out the window which you can read about I wanted to preach on that I had many men that I could use as sermon illustrations (laughs) can I just say yeah you know it's true so I thought no I won't do that and then I thought the latter half the latter part of Acts chapter 20 when there were tears involved and but I really feel um, in particular to land here in Acts chapter 20 I'm going to go from verse verses uh, 17 through to verse 25 and I just need to pick up here this is this is the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey and he's finishing the back leg of this third missionary journey we are reading here it's roughly 50 55 maybe 56 AD so he's getting on in years he's um, he is getting quite emotional because you're going to see that he in in the passage uh, where where we read into he is ministering uh, to some elders and leaders from Ephesus and he was previously there for three years spending time with them so he knows and loves these people really really well and his heart is strongly connected to these people but we're going to read from verse 17 on and uh, this is how it goes now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him and when the elders came to him this is what he said you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit not knowing what will happen to me there except that the holy spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me but i do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only i may finish my course in the ministry that i received from the lord jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of god and now behold i know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. So as far as he's concerned, he is never going to see these people that he dearly loves again. We can read further along there. It's really fascinating about a charge that he gives to his people, his elders, his overseas. He's he's, he's saying, listen, don't stray from the truth. I've exposed to the whole counsel of God, which is so very important. He, we, we see he was escorted to get on the, the ship to leave and it says at the end there verse 36 and when he would said these things he knelt down prayed with them all there was much weeping on the part of it all they embraced Paul they kissed him being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again and they accompanied him to that ship these are important words that a lover of the people shares to the people And when someone is getting ready to share some of the last words, prominent words, you want to pay special attention. And we're going to pick up just on three verses in particular today, which I I think hold weight to us. We're going to read from verse 23 through to verse, excuse me, verse 22 through to verse 24. And um, this is what it says, verse 22. Now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the spirit not knowing what will happen to me there constrained by the spirit your version might say compelled by the spirit that that literally the word constrained means bound bound by the spirit consider if you will um, a shackle amongst your foot like that you are you are so bound to the holy spirit he is 
constraining Paul. The Spirit is constraining him. He's compelling him. You've got to go. Have you ever felt at some point in your life where you, you may not be able to explain it, but you've been constrained by the Spirit, constrained to go, constrained to speak, constrained to stand, constrained to act. That's what Paul is saying here, that, that I, I, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going back. Can we show the map, please, of the third missionary expedition? We see he has gone up north. We previously read going up to Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and now he's starting to come back. We can see um, he's gone to Athens, he's gone back up to Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, then coming back down Troas, then he's at Miletus. And he's on the way back, but he knows that trouble awaits him. That's what he believes. How does he know that? He knows it because the Holy Spirit eventually testifies that it awaits for him. But what's important for us, he says, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know. There is an element of uncertainty. Uncertainty of the future. Certainly exactly of the details, the, the finer details of the picture that the Lord is painting with my life. We should never let uncertainty get in the way of obedience. Brothers and sisters, never let uncertainty of the future get in the way of obedience to the call of God. Paul was constrained, compelled, bound, moved by the Holy Spirit to do something, even though the finer details were not worked out. He just knew that he had to go. He had an inner knower. He, he, he knew, he just knew that he knew that he had to do something. Do you have an inner knowing of what God is saying to you? How has he called you to live? How has he called you to function? Has he spoken to you about your ministry, the finer details of your life? We know that he ordains us to be his sons and daughters, but he also has a finer ordination as to specifically what our lives would look like. And we're all called to do different things in different ways. What has he said to you? Do you have an inner deep conviction that is... That is that the Spirit is constraining you to do, constraining you to live, constraining for you to go. Do you know your call? We understand Paul says to live a life worthy of your calling. Because if we don't have that inner knowing, if we aren't constrained, we don't get that conviction, chances are we're going we're to be very cheap with our lives. We're not really going to care about our decisions, our choices, because it doesn't really matter so much. If Christianity to us is just something, oh, it's a chosen set of beliefs. I, I don't like Buddhism. I don't like Shintoism. I don't know about the Islam thing. I think I will choose Christianity. And then we subscribe to a set of teachings instead of giving our lives to a person, realizing that as we give our lives to a person, we get a better life. And then he gets to live his life in us and through us for others. But we've got to be constrained by the Spirit. Surely that would have caused a bit of discomfort. I like to know stuff. I like to, in a sense, have control of my present and my future. Paul has resigned to the fact that he doesn't know. And he doesn't need to know those details. He finds somewhat a, a comfort in the discomfort of uncertainty. It's like being on the rocky seas in the boat and you're asleep in the boat, even though there's a lot of rockiness as the boat is moving. And there's uncharted waters, but you know what? It's okay. Because the Lord's with you in the boat. I again like to plan for my future. I think planning is important, but the Lord ordains my steps. I, I like to think about the future. How am I going to pay my house off? How am I going to pay my bills off? What does my nest egg look like? But I, I don't know. Sometimes I think perhaps I have bought into the lie of earthly securities. 
I wonder if at times I have spent too much of my attention and my affection and my adoration trying to plan out my next 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, when in reality, I, I, tomorrow's not a given. What does Matthew 6, tell us? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Seek first, not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth. When everything else works, doesn't work. When, um, when I've run out of money, when I've run out of friends, when I've run out of reputation, seek first, first, foremost, before anything. And the following verse is a really interesting one. The following verse says, Therefore, because of this, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Here's a question we can ask ourselves. Is my need for details hindering me? The finer details I need to know. Is that getting in the way? from obeying God, from apprehending the call of God on my life. Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, he was told to get up and go, not knowing the details of the future. Is God calling you to get up and go? Moses was commanded to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He had his own issues. He was stuttering and he was insecure, but he through that, he just got up and he led the people. Is God calling you to lead without knowing the details of the future? Esther in chapter 4 didn't know the details about her future, but she, she needed to intercede for the people, didn't she? So she got up and she spoke to the king. She saved the whole people because of her courage. Is God calling you to speak up? Mary in Luke chapter 1 wasn't given details of the future of the child to which she was carrying, but she carried the Lord without knowing the next 10, 20, 30 years. Is God calling you to carry, even give birth to something? Is He entrusting you with that? What about Noah? In Genesis chapter 6, God spoke to him about building an ark, but didn't get the finer details of the future. When's the rain exactly coming? What's the future going to look like? He just knew that he had to do something in the moment, and so he obeyed. And he, he, was, he was a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist in that moment, wasn't he? <laughs> and they all came and laughed him, and they mocked him. But he was proven right. God calling you to build something without you knowing the details of the future I love this verse he was constrained by the spirit not knowing what will happen to me there he says verse 23 then says except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me oh that's joyous I love serving the Lord. Afflictions, they're just on the other side. Oh, thank you, Lord, for constraining me. Imprisonment, woo! <laughs> but he knew that he was on course. He knew that he was running a race. We see that in his language, actually. We read through some of his letters. And what we can learn from that is we should not quit running when the course leads to suffering. Don't quit running when the course leads to suffering because I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, suffering is going to take place in life. It's going to happen. You're going to have moments where you go through difficulties. You're going to go through moments where there are tribulations and, 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 and there is trials and there are moments of trauma. It's going to happen. And the Holy Spirit didn't just constrain Paul to go without certainty about the future, but he did actually tell him, listen, uh, you're going you, you, you're gonna go and experience some imprisonment and there are some afflictions that await you. Earlier we read Acts chapter 14, verse 22. It says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
in the last known letter that we see Paul writing, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But the beauty of persecution, the beauty of affliction, the beauty of suffering, is that God does some incredible things in the midst of it. I spend probably too much time thinking about what's going to happen to me. But God's more interested in what's happening in me and then what happens through me. For much of our lives, there are going to be many situations, environmental circumstances, that we do not have control over. But what we do have control over is working with the Spirit to have mastery over our soul for Christ to be formed in us. And He is far more interested in, by His Spirit, conforming us to the image of Jesus and doing His will and clinging to Him than having a cushy, comfortable, affluent life. Can I have my, um, my afflictions? <laughs> Can I... <laughs> Can I have my imprisonment? <laughs> no. It's kind of like this. Just put one about there. Yeah, that'll do. Put one around about here. Yeah. So I don't like, well, normally speaking, I don't really like to go through challenging moments in life. Anyone here like going through challenging moments? Oh, it does bring us closer to God. Thank you very much. Top of the class for you, young lady. But there are things that, um, when we have these moments, I'll move this over here. Um, when we go through life, <coughs> suffering does take place. And as we go through life, and one of the things as a parent I'm trying to encourage my children in is to not necessarily run, th run away from the challenges. But when a challenge comes, Embrace God where you can in the midst of them, not to run away from them because you're going to have to go through life and experience them. I, I know we, 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 we want to avoid them. But again, Psalm 23 says, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. So when we go through moments of suffering, some things take place for us. We can learn reliance on God. 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. This is not an easy one. This is a tricky one. This is hard. This is beyond life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So reliance. When we go through moments of suffering, we can learn reliance. But we can also 
not just have reliance on God, but righteousness with God. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to go verses 6, 10, and 11, okay? Hebrews 12. The Lord disciplines the one he loves, chastises every son whom he receives. Verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for a good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit, watch this, of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So as we go through life on the journey, as we go on the course, as we run the race, as we go through these seasons of suffering, there is reliance on God, righteousness with God. And can I just say discipline, we've got to get out of our mind that discipline is just God punishing us for being bad. It's, it's more than that. He's growing us. He's disciplining us. Like when you go to a gym and, 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 and you practice boxing and fighting, you're disciplining yourself, even your body. Okay? That's what our Father is doing with us. But there's also reward from God that we get as we embrace Him in suffering. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It's preparation for what we're going to receive. As we go through life on this journey, we are understanding that this reward comes from God. It's preparation for us. Another one, refinement. Refinement by God. Philippians chapter 3. Let's go verse 8 to 10. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. If that's not a refining process, I'll tell you what. Now, if I go through my life's journey and I avoid and run away from moments of affliction, imprisonment, tribulation, and I miss out on the opportunity to suffer well, then I'm missing out on these great things that Paul talks about. And so inside, I don't know about you, but inside there is a war going on between flesh and spirit. Flesh says, get out, jump ship, run away from those moments. Spirit says, uh-uh, God's got something to do in you, through you, to bless others and for his glory. So, a question, am I prepared to suffer well? See, Suffering doesn't have to be miserable. Because misery is a choice. Suffering can actually be joyful. What? Are you serious? Yes. You can experience joy in the midst of your suffering. Though it's terrible and torturous in one respect, you can have a state of the heart, a disposition of the heart where there is joy of it that as you're thrown into the fiery furnace like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they are walking around unbound free and who's showing up Jesus they're not bound anymore they're free or like Paul in Acts chapter 16 Paul and Silas thrown into the prison what are they doing when they could be complaining and whining they're praying and praising God You don't have to be miserable when you're suffering. Choose joy. Choose joy. A 
diamond, most beautiful, but hardened of gems, takes many, 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 many years to form. Under immense amount of pressure, carbon is exposed to over a long period of time, but it comes out so beautiful, doesn't it? How many diamonds are there in God's family? It takes time takes pressure. We all like to be diamonds, but we don't like the process of becoming one. <laughs> what, what, what about pottery? Have you ever done pottery before? And uh, you, you, w- w- when you get clay, what does the potter do? He or she will knead it and work it and soften it, work to get at all the impurities. It takes time and pressure that's applied. But with the clay, you can form that lump of clay into fine porcelain not just after it's worked but when it's been exposed to the white fiery heat of a kiln anyone feel like they're being exposed (laughs) to the heat of a kiln at the moment or maybe you feel like you're being pounded like a lump of clay but oh that we would be like clay in the potter's hands to pray lord make me like you do what you need to do but oh don't touch me it's too hard So don't quit running when the course leads to suffering. And then it says in verse 24, But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The New King James Version actually says, but none of these matter to me. Who has that version in them? At the beginning, it says, but none of these matter to me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. But I don't account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. What does he say? Stay on track. And do whatever it takes to finish well. Stay on track. Do whatever it takes to finish well. Don't just start well. Finish well. I was at a school carnival the other day. And there was a student, as I was watching the kids do a long distance run. And she started off so strong I'm like man she is she is gonna blitz the crowd this young Sudanese girl but as I waited four or five minutes she ran out of steam she ended up starting walking she ended up finishing last started well but didn't finish well and as believers we're encouraged to stay the course to stay the path And focus on finishing well. Do whatever you can to finish well. What God has called you to, who He's called you to be, where He's called you to go, what He's called you to build. Finish well and do whatever it takes. There's no point in starting well, even having a great middle of the course run, and then just quitting toward the end. Finish strong, brothers and sisters. Finish strong. Finish strong. It's better to be faithful as you run the race. It's better to be faithful and die than unfaithful and live. Because we think that, uh, oh, I'll enjoy my life and I'll come back and serve God later. When I'm older, I'll do that. No, we don't know what the future holds. The, 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 the future is uncertain. Click on the news, have a look. The world's gone mad. The world's gone crazy. But I'm okay because my certainty and my security is not in the world. My identity, my certainty, my security is in Him. And He is the consistent one. He is the faithful one. He is the loving one. He is the sure one. He's the anchor to my soul. He's my joy and my reward. We heard from Marjorie McFadgen this morning, and I've been thinking about you, Alan and Marjorie. I know I always brag to others about you. I'm going to do it again this morning. We went to a, a, a trip to Zambia in June, 
and these guys were up and at them every morning, keeping up with the team, sharing the devotions, sharing publicly, Alan and Marjorie McBadgen. And you're now in your 50s, can I say? 80s, they're in their 80s. And they're talking about, yeah, let's put it together, put our hands together. They're talking about going overseas again. Alan, I remember you, was it five, six years ago, saying, I I don't think I'm going to live past 80. Now you're 84, 86. Holy moly, geez, time's flying past. And he's talking about another trip. What does that say to me, to to young-ish guys like me? If forerunners like Alan and Marjorie can focus on finishing well, oh. What excuse have I got? Oh, but I'm getting old now. Oh, no. No, they are, on, they are on the track and they are ministering to people. What excuse have I got? Finish well. Do whatever it takes. It's stay on track. Hebrews 12 verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's how we do it. That's how we run the race. Look to Jesus. James 1 verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want that crown. The crowns I get from this life, it doesn't matter. It's, it's nothing. I want an eternal one that, that comes from Him and knowing Him, loving Him, enjoying Him. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. I can't run your race for you. And you can't run your race for me. You can't get my crown and I can't get what's set for you. I'm responsible for my own race and I've got to stay in my lane. We're all running the race together, but we've got to stay in our own lane. And all of our races, funnily enough, look different. They're at different lengths. They have different obstacles. And that's okay. Philippians 3, 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on. Read that passage. It's fantastic. You can't look behind. You've got to press on. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, again, this is toward the end of his life. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. What does he say? I have kept the faith. He wrote Acts chapter 20 some maybe 10 years before he wrote 2 Timothy. Some 10 years. So when he writes in Acts 20, he doesn't know what the future holds. He gets imprisoned a couple of times after that. He eventually is martyred after 2 Timothy. But he had some 10 years left. But at that point, he says, I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I haven't turned. I haven't swayed. I haven't buckled. I haven't bowed. I haven't bent. I have kept the faith. Now, that is encouraging, inspiring, and challenging for us all the same, that we would keep the faith. One famous theologian said, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. And that theologian, can I show a picture please? Is this man here. Who knows who, who, knows who that is? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, well done, top of the class. He was a German theologian. He was born in 1906. He was a pastor. He was an anti-Nazi dissident. He was renowned for his profound faith and his moral 
courage in the face of adversity. He wrote an incredible uh, book called The Cost of Discipleship. Many of us have studied the idea of cheap grace and costly grace, which stemmed from his works. He believed in resistance, strong Christian resistance against Nazism. He also believed, though, that there are sometimes necessary actions that must be taken to stand against oppression, like Adolf Hitler. He eventually was put in prison, prison uh, concentration camp, and he was executed at Flossenburg in 1945, before the end of World War II, for what he believed in an effort to bring down Hitler. He didn't cave, he didn't bow, he had to finish well. I don't think Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have realized how much of his writings, his assertions, his ideas would have affected the modern Christian era because it all really started to come about after World War II, after he died. Never underestimate the influence that you carry even beyond your years. I still now remember prayers that my grandmother would give me as a child, though at the time it meant very little to me. It's only now I'm like, oh my goodness, I would see you get up at five in the morning with a cup of tea, spend time quietly with the Lord. When I get up early in the morning, nice and quietly with a cup of coffee, I think often about my grandmother who modeled this to me. Never underestimate the scope of your influence, even if it's beyond your years. Just stay the course and do whatever it takes to finish well. As we run the course, though, let's not fall into the trap of making assumptions about where the finish line is. Do you know what Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually said? He said, may God in his mercy lead us through these times, but above all, may he lead us to himself. So the race is actually not about the race. The course is not about the course. Bonhoeffer was speaking out publicly about all of the oppression that was taking place at the time, but the, the point of all it was Jesus. And if we just keep our eyes on Jesus and fix our eyes on Jesus and not just on where the finish line is, we're not just going to plan for 10 years. Once I've used up my nest egg, maybe I'll make it to 75 or 80. Oh, who knows, 85, 90, who knows? Because I like to quantify, I like to work things out and calculate, I want to know where is that finish line. Okay, well, I've got how many years left? The goal is not the finish line, the goal is Jesus. Because I don't know where that finish line is. It was just months ago in this church family we lost a loved member, Tim Wiegand. Tim Wigand and his wife Tamika, I'm sharing with permission, and their two boys are a very much loved part of this family. Tim passed away at the age of 29, 28. We didn't know where the finish line was for Tim. But an accident that took place brought an end. We might like to think we've got 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but we just don't know. So finishing well is not just as we get older. Finishing well is now in the present. Finish well now. Live a life running the course now, finishing well, finishing strong, staying the course, and do whatever it takes. Don't make excuses. Don't be apathetic. Don't be lazy. Stay the course. Stay true. Live for Jesus in the present because we don't know. We just don't know what the future holds. It is uncertain, but he's certain. It's, un it's, it's not secure. It's insecure, but he's secure.
It's only in and through the person of Jesus that we can run this race. But let's live with a sense of urgency. Because I tell you what, if I don't die living for him, he's coming back real soon anyway. If, if, if I don't see death and corruption in my body, it's because he's coming first. And I want to live with a sense of urgency for when he returns. Which by the looks of things has happened pretty quickly. Can we pray about this? If you're comfortable, would you stand up with me please? As we finish, my final question for us is this. As we pray, am I running with the end in sight? Am I running the race with the end in sight? Or am I just focusing on detours and distractions? Am I focusing on Jesus and running to Him, running with Him, running through Him? In Acts we read that it's in Him, through Him, for Him. Can we pray about this? If you're comfortable, would you raise your hands as an act of surrender? Father, we come to you in the only name that matters, the name of Jesus. We thank you for men like the Apostle Paul who lives in such a way that it moves us, it inspires and challenges us to, with a reckless abandonment, pursue you not just in the future but in the present would you help us to reorganize and reprioritize where we have run outside of our lane where we have been stuck and maybe we are stuck in this moment help us to get up dust ourselves off and keep going father we ask that we would live lives where we are constrained by the spirit that we would moved and compelled and bound by the spirit to live for your glory, for your purposes and not our own. Lord, where there are things in our hearts, maybe there's rebellion and there's selfishness and there's, there's greed, there is, there is hostility in our hearts toward you when your plan's prevailing. Would you lead us into repentance? By your spirit, would you lead us? Would you help us navigate through a life of absolute surrender? Father, again this morning, we yield to you. We give it over to you. Teach us, Lord, to live full and die empty. To live in a constant state of outpouring. And we can't do it without your grace. We can't do it without your spirit. Help us not to do this in our own strength. Before we move on to the updates, I encourage you now to take a few moments to spend with God and ask Him what it is that He's been highlighting to you through the scriptures and through the Word today and just sit and chat with Him about that.
Next week from 6 p.m. is our encounter night. It is happening in our Malaga Hub. Great opportunity to come together, listen to Holy Spirit, enjoy His presence in worship and adoration. We want to encourage you to come along. So feel free to come. No RSVP needed. Leading Well is uh, a training course written at Grace Life for Grace Life to help us equip uh, the congregation to be able to uh, lead a small group. You know, I've done this training a number of times and one of the things I love about it is that it isn't just a to-do list, this is what you do in a group. It's actually about developing the heart, my heart, as a leader so that um, I can relationally connect with those who are, uh, I'm going to be involved with in a small group. If, if you're looking for something that will uh, engage your heart as well as give you skills, then join us for our Leading Well training. It'll be uh, happening from the October the 5th to November the 2nd, Saturday mornings, 7.30 to 10 o'clock at the Ellenbrook, congregate, uh, at the Ellenbrook campus, um, but you are all welcome. Ask God whether this is the time for you to be equipped to be able to minister to others in a small group setting. Grace Life men are excited to host a family picnic at Muscle Pool West in Whiteman Park. Come along for a fun picnic, bike riding, ball games and barbecue. Um, gather your friends and family and loved ones for a delightful day of laughter, delicious food and the beauty of the outdoors. It's on, of, it's on October the 19th from 11.30 a.m. Feel free to come along and invite everyone that you can think of. If you need any more details or you got more questions or information that you need, make sure that you speak to Trevor in Malaga and Mark in Ellenbrook. Otherwise, ensure to put your name down at the sign up station. Today, right after the service, if you're a high school age, I want to encourage you to head down to Alta Laguna. Park. You are invited to bring your picnic chair along and get connected with other young people in the Grace Life family. Plenty of opportunity to have fun. And so there are giant games and also there's going to be a little bit of food bringing on, on chairs, I said. Make sure you get there 12.30 to about 3 p.m. Hey, one of the markers of the people of God is their generosity. And we practice that generosity through regular contribution to the family of Grace Life Church. We'd love to invite you on this journey if you haven't yet begun the journey. And if you have, we want to thank you for your generosity. There are many ways to give and many of those are on your screen. You can also speak to somebody at the information desk about how to give. Thanks for watching today's sermon. We do pray that God has spoken to you um, and that this sermon would impact your world and your life. And if you do have any questions or you are deciding to follow Jesus for the first time, then feel free to contact us on the email below and we'd love to help you out. Have a great week. <laughs>